All right, good to see you here this evening, and uh, welcome to the midweek service. Take a songbook. We're going to start by singing together. We're going to sing what she's been playing, 531, 531, all hail the power of Jesus' name, 531. Once you have it, why don't you stand to sing it? Everybody standing by their Bible leaders. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. On that last, oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. Good singing tonight. Good to see you in church Wednesday evening. And uh, what a day that's going to be, and uh, it's going to be soon, I think. I thought it was, I think it was very interesting. The, uh, the, the guy who's running for president that is the deal maker, uh, who brags about making good deals with everybody, you know, wrote a book about it, I think. He says the ultimate deal for him would be bringing peace to the Middle East, bringing peace to Israel and the Arabs. And uh, that is what the Antichrist will do. Now, that's not who that is, but he certainly would have the spirit of one. And uh, that's, uh, it's interesting how that's, that's become one of the, you know, the ultimate deal. And that's really biblically what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to establish a peace treaty uh, between Israel and the Arab nations. And uh, it's not going to last. Uh, but listen, before that takes place, we're getting out of here. And uh, the Lord's going to come back, and those who know him as their Savior will be taken out, the Bible says, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And if you don't know him as your Savior, you're going to be left behind, and you're going to have it for an awful, awful time, uh, a time this world's never seen before. So uh, uh, you want to make sure you're going to go up to be with the Lord. Amen? You want to make sure you know him as your Savior. If you've never received him as your Savior, I hope you'll do that tonight. All right, good to see you here this evening. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you for Wednesday night church. And Lord, we're thankful for the day, as we just sang about, that one day we're all going to sing together, all hail the power of Jesus' name. And we'll all fall down at your feet and give praise and glory to you because you're worthy for all that you've done for us and for who you are the Almighty God. And Lord, we bow before you this evening now, and we ask you to meet with us tonight in this service, and you'd speak to our hearts this evening. Give us what we need here in the middle of the week. Uh, Lord, help us to focus. Help us not let our minds to wander and miss what you have for us this evening. So speak to us tonight, and Lord, may you be pleased with the service. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Turn with me, if you would, to 441, 441. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, sunlight in my soul. Let's sing that first together. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. On that third, 
While walking in the light of God, I sweet communion find. I press with holy vigor on and leave this world behind. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love within. And on that last, soon I shall see him as he is, the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love within. Jason's going to read a letter for you this evening from uh, Gary and Artis Zimmerman. Uh, they are reaching the Jewish people for the Lord, and they particularly recently have really uh, been able to come in contact with a lot of the Jewish scrolls of the Old Testament. And so uh, just a little uh, preview of what he's going to be talking to you about and uh, the way God is using these to allow them to get the attention of Jewish people. It's really, really fascinating, and I'm, I'm not sure that we've ever read a letter from the Zimmermans on Wednesday night, and uh, so I think you'll enjoy this this evening. Brother Jason? Dear friends of Israel, God blessed artists and me by allowing Mark and Lydia from Odessa, Ukraine, stay with us for a while. Mark gave us a good report concerning the print shop we set up in their church. They are producing a huge quantity of gospel literature and have multiplied that quantity by giving their used equipment to other churches as the parent shop upgrades. We set up the print shop in Odessa because there was a large Jewish community in that area of the Ukraine. While they were in our home, Lydia, Mark's wife, was particularly interested in our work with the Hebrew Scrolls. She is a Jewish believer, and she shared her salvation experience and told us how hard it is to share the gospel with her Jewish relatives and friends. The older Jews in that area have suffered great persecution by the hands of Gentile Christians, and they believe Christianity is a Gentile religion. Artists and I gave her several pieces of Hebrew scrolls that may help her reach her relatives. Mark had run out of Russian gospel tracts in their travels across America, and we were able to fill up their box from the Russian tracts I had printed in my office. I recently started working with a Russian-speaking Jewish community in my area of Houston. They have been very receptive, and several attended my three-hour lecture on writing and preservation of Hebrew biblical scrolls. You can't believe how many times it is possible to teach the gospel in a three-hour lecture when your lesson is specifically on the Hebrew scrolls that make up the Old Testament. Every Bible doctrine can be easily covered. At the meeting, there were also many Hebrew Christians. A cantor from local synagogue also came to the service. We know the service was a blessing to believers and unbelievers alike. They were all very excited to see this many Hebrew scrolls in one place. Yesterday, I received the following email from the rabbi of the congregation. After the presentation, Ken McBee and I got to talking, and we would like to make your dream of getting all of your scrolls photographed and online into a reality. With your permission, Ken can begin the process of photographing your scrolls in a couple of weeks, and then on my end, I can begin the process of creating a website that allows people to interact with the images and trade ideas and thoughts on the scrolls and the passages. Let me know if this meets with your approval. I know I've said the following many times in my prayer letters since we received the first scroll in 1999, working with the Hebrew scrolls is the greatest tool we have ever to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. There can be absolutely no argument about Gentile Christians changing this or that verse of scripture. They are clearly exposed to the word of God in any form, in a form they will receive, and then the Holy Spirit works on a receptive mind with the explanation we offer. It is scrolls like the ones we are using that were common in Israel at the time of Christ. This was the only word of God except the spoken words 
of Christ that was available to the early Christians for many years. The gospel spoke of this in Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Artis and I are very proud of our three sons. As Christian men, all three, Daniel, Samuel, and Joseph, wanted to serve in the military when they were young. Joseph was in the National Guard and then the U.S. Army as a chaplain's assistant serving four years in Fort McPherson in Georgia. Samuel was going into the U.S. Marines, but his college music major sent him in another direction. Daniel served in the U.S. Navy as a chaplain and was promoted to lieutenant commander serving the U.S. Marines submarine fleet and surface fleet. One day, artists and I were at the U.S. Naval Base, and we went into the guard shack to see if they would let us on base to see the ships. The captain of the guard said it was a work day, and it would be impossible to visit any ship, much less get on base. I told him I had served on one of the ships currently on base, and we were in town teaching at a Baptist church and probably would never have the chance again. He took us aside and said the following, I will soon die of cancer, and if you will tell me how to be saved, I will let you on the base. Wow. wow. We sent several, spent several minutes talking and giving him the gospel. Then he gave me his home address and asked me to write and tell him more. We corresponded, and I believe he truly understood the gospel. He said he believed what I had shown him. Amen. Thank you all f so much for your years of prayer and support. The Zimmermans. Isn't that great? Wow. Divine appointments. That's great. That's a good report. All right. You have your uh, prayer guide tonight? Anybody need one? Anybody get missed? Everybody good? Wonderful. All right. We'll start on the back, of course, and uh, pray for the CRC uh, down at the RU, down at the CRC tomorrow night, 630 to 830. And then uh, Reformers Unanimous here at the church Friday night from 7 to 9. And then, of course, Saturday morning out at London, 8.30 to 10.30. The men's breakfast at 8.15 on Saturday morning, and we'll look forward to that. And that'll be a great time together, fellas. If you haven't signed up for that, get your name on the list downstairs, will you please? And then, of course, our soul winning and bus visitation at 10 a.m. following that. Be praying Sunday for the offering. I'm sure you have been. And uh, ask the Lord to, to bless that in a great way. And we appreciate you doing that. On the inside are the reports from the... A prison had a great Sunday morning, 153 here Sunday morning, and of course uh, one saved and then one profession of faith and then the three that were baptized, and we praise the Lord for that and uh, continue to pray for the church requests and the church ministries. And uh, Richard Mitchell, did Richard come home? That's amazing, isn't it? Wow, had surgery yesterday and they put him home today. So continue to pray for healing uh, for him and uh, for his heart to be open to the gospel as well, okay? And uh, Brother Ed, I saw him Monday, and uh, he's in the rehab process, and um, he's, he's doing okay. He called the therapist his tormentor, so uh, that's uh, about par for the course, isn't it, when you're rehabbing a knee, two knees, and, uh, but he was uh, in good spirits otherwise, and we had a nice visit together. Keep praying for him. That's, uh, that's a rough rehab there. And uh, appreciate you doing that. Uh, pray for Brother Bob Wallace. Uh, Bob is home again this evening, still not feeling well, has uh, some good times and some not so good times. He goes to the doctor tomorrow again, so uh, please keep him in your prayer for his health, okay? And, um, of course, continue to pray for those who are in authority and our military and uh, those battling cancer. And then uh, these on our salvation list, which continues to grow. And uh, praying that God will put someone in their life that will uh, they'll have their ear and they'll be willing to listen to them, give them the gospel. OK, the unreached people groups of the world. And I hope you lift them up in prayer that God will send forth laborers into his harvest. And then our missionaries uh, highlighted this evening by the Zimmermans uh, and their good report reaching the Jewish folks in the USA. And pray that, you know, that, that getting those scrolls up on a website where literally, literally billions of people can view them and see them uh, is just amazing and uh, God, God's going to bless that in a, in a wonderful way all right let's uh, let's bow our heads and uh, we'll have prayer together this evening uh, I'm going to ask Brother Linky if you would Brett why don't you come up and lead us in our prayer this evening and uh, as Brett leads us audibly why don't you pray along with him silently and uh, let's unite our hearts together in prayer right now 
Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for the day you've given us, the, the weather to enjoy. Lord, I thank you for uh, Diane's son getting healed up. Thank you for the, the doctors and the healing hands. I pray for continued uh, strength and healing there. Lord, let this time be a time where you can speak to his heart. Lord, we thank you so much for the, the great report from the Zimmermans and how God's just using that ministry. And Lord, we pray that you just help us to use the ministries we have here to reach the people around. We thank you so much for the additions and for the growth of those coming. God, I pray you just help us to be attentive to the Word of God. Help us to use it the way that we ought to. And Lord, I pray that you would just, don't just increase this church so we can have a big church. Lord, grow this church because you're here. God, we need you here. We need your power here. We need your Holy Spirit just to blow this place apart. So God, I pray you just help us to, to be the Christians that we know to be. Help us to be the examples that we, we know to be. Lord, help us to, to show the love of Christ to the lost and dying world. Lord, be with the elections that are coming up. We need a leader that fears you. And Lord, I pray that you just help us to do right. God, I pray you just be in throughout those that are in the powers of authority that they would take the leading of the Holy Spirit and do what they know is right. And God, we thank you so much for a place like this, a church home. And God, we pray that you just lead, guide, and direct. We thank you so much for the blessings that we have. And God, I pray that we use the liberty and freedoms that we have in this country to vocalize the gospel to a lost and dying world. So Lord, we thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 223, 223, draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. Let's all stand. 223 on that first together. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me near, near, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me near, near, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious pleading side. On that last all together, there are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me near, near, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. All right, you can be seated. Ushers will come and get our offering here this evening, and of course, first Wednesday night of the month, and we'll take the offering for Brother Yoder and his trip uh, to Armenia with the pastor's conference coming up. Um, I think you're at eight, 800 and something, wasn't it? Somewhere in eight, 840, something like that. It's in the 800s, and uh, so we're probably looking, I think, somewhere between 13 to 1500 for the tickets to go, so we're about halfway there. And uh, be good, uh, good to get him there, amen? amen. We don't just want to get him there; we want to get him back too, okay? And uh, that's important. So, want to help with that? So, uh, let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on the giving tonight. Father, thank you for the privilege uh, to give. We pray your blessing on the offering this evening as we uh, ask you to provide the needs for Brother Yoder to be able to uh, help in this pastor's conference coming up over in Armenia and be there to help Brother Moreland get established and set up. And oh Lord, you know all the the things that could take place and that need to take place. And uh, we pray, God, that you'll provide through the offerings and through your own way of meeting the need, Lord, for him to be able to get the tickets and to go there and back. And, Lord, continue to supply his need on the deputation trail and uh, open the hearts of pastors and churches to partner with them in the, the great work of training nationals and uh, establishing churches and getting the Bible uh, into the hands of people who've never had a Bible before. So, Lord, bless the offering this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, take your Bible this evening, if you would, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. Notice with me, if you will, verse number 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven, heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, under their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, as we look at this passage tonight and we uh, endeavor to draw from here these lessons about how we ought to live uh, in the light of your return and in the light of your judgment upon the earth, I pray that you'll teach us and help us. And Lord, I pray that we'd live the Bible we learned this evening, that we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. And Lord, I pray you'll, you'll minister and, and speak to each of us as only you can. Help me as I bring the lesson, and please help the folks as they listen tonight. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we spoke of the day of the Lord, and it's also referred to here as the day of God, which is, we, remember, we, we talked about it's not a 24-hour day like Wednesday or Thursday or days like we refer to, but it is a period of time. And it is a time of judgment. There's a coming a time when God's going to judge the earth. In fact, He's going to judge it with fire. He will not judge it with water. He made a promise. He'd never destroy the earth by water again. And He made that promise. And what was the sign He gave us that He'd never do that? It was the rainbow. But He's going to destroy it with fire. It's going to burn up. And with that in mind, if and, 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 and with that, in, in our minds, in that picture before us, that God is going to burn everything up, how should that affect the way we live? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, because that's what we're going to study tonight, okay? Uh, how are we to live? And so the Bible says here, here, verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So we see, number one, we're supposed to live in holiness and godliness. In holiness and godliness. Holy simply means to be set apart to God. Set apart to God. And we understand if we're going to be set apart to God, we have to be set apart from the world. If you're going to be drawn to God, you have to be drawn away from the world. They are exact opposites of one of another. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. You can't be a friend of God and a friend of the world. It's an impossibility. They're polar opposites. And so if you're going to draw nigh to God, you have to not get attached to the things of the world. And so if I know that it's all going to burn up anyway, why would I get so attached to the things of the world? But we get attached to the things of the world. And, and, and we have to make sure that our affection is set on things above, not on things of the earth. And that's where our, our affection is. That's where our desires are. That's where our, our heart belongs. 
We're to walk in the light as He is in the light. We are not to love, we're to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Okay? We can't get attached to them and let them steal the love that we ought to have for the Lord, Lord Jesus. If everything is just going to be burned up, and by the way, we're not taking anything with us. When we leave in the moment and twinkle of an eye, you're not gathering anything up. And if the Lord chooses to take you before the rapture, before He comes and you go the way of death, as they say, uh, there's never been the U-Haul following the hearse yet. You don't take it with you. You, you leave it all behind. And, and whatever's left behind eventually is going to burn up. And so, but why, why then are we so adamant, especially American Christians, at gathering stuff and gathering things and wanting to have more things? We get the bumper stickers that say, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Uh, no, whoever dies with the most toys dies. And he leaves all the toys behind. And they're going to burn up someday. And so we don't, uh, all these things must be dissolved. So God says that that, that, that being in mind, we ought, to, we ought to endeavor to see how holy we should be. Departing from the things of the world. Dying to sin. Dying to self. And wanting to, to be as close to God as is possible to be. You understand, sin the, the, the beautiful creation of God, the heavens and the earth that God created is under the curse of sin. And that sin is so uh, horrendous. The sin, and by the way, sin came because of man. And that put the curse upon the world. And that's why, listen, it's not, listen, not going to be cured. It cannot be lifted. The only, way, the only thing God can ever do is absolutely destroy it and start over and give us a new heavens and a new earth. Now, if, if that's the abomination that sin is, that God cannot do anything with it but destroy it, dissolve it completely, how much should we abhor sin? What should be our attitude towards sin? We certainly should not allow it and, 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 and coddle it and allow it to, to, to remain in our lives. It ought to be hated by us. It ought to be an abomination to us. And so we understand. We're, listen, notice what verse 13 says. We're looking for His promise for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth what? Righteousness. We ought, to be, we ought to be getting ready for the world to come. What's in the world to come? Righteousness. If all you want to live for now is unrighteousness, you're not. how are you going to enjoy heaven? You think you're, you're just instantly going to enjoy the people of God when you don't like the people of God here? You think you'll enjoy spending time with Jesus when you don't enjoy spending time with Jesus now? You understand? It's not going to be just an instant change and all of a sudden you're going to be spiritual. I want to prepare and be fit for the new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. All our conversation. Our, our behavior, as, the, as it would were. No matter who it's with, listen, no matter whether it's friend or enemy, whether it's with family or with foe, it, our, our, our relationships ought to be governed by holiness. What is right in the sight of God? What is right in the sight of God to do? Not just what would Jesus do, but we, by the Word of God, we can know what Jesus did. We don't have to just rely on, well, what do I think Jesus would do here? And I think He'd do this. No, I think He'd do this. Well, listen, we don't have to think. As far as it, it's not up to our thoughts. It's up to what does God say He did. And we have His example. And we can follow His steps because of the Word of God. And so that's why the Bible says, exercise yourself unto godliness. Exercise yourself unto godliness. So we ought to, we ought to devote ourselves to wanting to be set apart to God. Not, not, not how close can I get to the, to the world and still maybe hold on to God. How much can I, how, how far can I reach and still kind of keep in touch with God when I need something? I mean, I still want, I still want the genie in my pocket so I can rub the lamp when I'm really in a bad way. That's how many people live. 
They, they, they don't think much about God until something happens in their life or something bad takes place in their life. And then, you know what? I better go to church. Well, I had a rough week or this happened or that happened. I better go to church Sunday. And then they want to pull God and, get, and, and pull God out. Okay? That's not, that's not the, the Christian service and that's not the Christian life. That's not holiness the way he's talking about here. Look at a couple of scriptures with me, will you? Hold your finger there in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, if you will, and look over at Philippians chapter 3. Go to your left, uh, back through James and past Hebrews, and keep going to your left, past Timothy, and you'll get Colossians, and then you'll come to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians 3, we have the same wording here. It says in verse 20, Philippians 3, verse 20, notice what it says, our conversation, now conversation, understand now, the word conversation has just come to mean what we say. But in Bible days, the conversation, that word, didn't just mean what you said. It meant how you lived. It was, it was your whole behavior uh, that went with it. So he's saying our conversation and our behavior, the way we conduct our lives, is in heaven. All right? From whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, that's where Ephesians tells us, I'm already seated in the heavenlies. Positionally, that's where we are in Christ. Now let's live up to that. Let's live. Somebody says, well, Pastor, now wait a minute. I don't want to be so heavenly minded. I'm no earthly good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> where, where, where most of us are so far from that, we're never going to get in trouble. Okay? I've yet to find a believer who is so heavenly minded they weren't any earthly good. I, I've seen many a believer who were too earthly minded they weren't any heavenly good. Absolutely. And so let's, let's, let's make sure that our behavior, our conversation is in heaven. Now, go to 1 Timothy. Now turn to your right, go past Colossians, Thessalonians, and hit 1 Timothy. Paul writing to Timothy in chapter 4, in verse number 12. Paul writes Timothy and he says, Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of of the believers in word in conversation there's our word again in charity and spirit and faith and purity you're saying hey you're to be an example of the believer in your behavior in the way you conduct your life hey what I do my business no it isn't you're to be an example and by the way this isn't talking to some old guy he said Timothy let no man despise thy youth Young people ought to set an example. Young people ought to make sure they're setting the right example of how to live for God. And they're in conversation that they would be holy and godly in their behavior. Keep going to the right and go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Again, we find our word conversation here. Look at Hebrews 13 and verse 5. The scripture says, let your conversation, let your behavior, let your lifestyle, it says, let it be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Listen, let your, let your behavior be without covetousness. Quit, quit always wanting something else. And later on he would tell Timothy, Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Be content with such things you have. Listen, uh, be content with the things you have because of who you have. Who do you have? The Lord Jesus. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And the promise is when, the, the, when we give with what He's given to us, when we give that to the work of God, you know what the promise is in Philippians 4.19? My God shall supply all your need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If Jesus, God said in Romans 8, if He spared not His own Son but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Why would God not want to give us the things we need if He gave us His Son? If He gave His Son, 
What's the problem with giving us the rent money? What's the problem with paying the mortgage? Uh, how hard is it to give you food and clothing, shelter? He gave his son. Anything below that is, is, is not a problem. So we're to, we're to conduct ourselves in holiness. You remember the, the parable Jesus told, and, and he talked about the, uh, the, the, the man at the vineyard. He said and he, he went away, and he was going to come back, but he tarried his coming. And then the servants decided, well, he's not coming back. And they began to beat each other up and be mean to one another and fight with each other. It reminds me of how we are in Christianity. Huh? We kind of forgot he's coming back. And, and we're not living in the light that he's coming back. Hey, if, if you knew that, that, that by Thursday night at 7.30, Jesus would come back, what would you do tomorrow? Whatever you do tomorrow, that's, how, that's what you should do tomorrow. Because he could come back tomorrow. That's how, you ought, that's how we ought to approach every day. That this could be the day. And if this is the day, I want to be found doing this. I want to be holy. I want to be godly in Christ Jesus. Alright, 2 Peter chapter 3. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation with godliness? Looking for, verse 12, and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Now he says, the, the second thing we're supposed to be living is in expectation. We live in holiness and godliness. Secondly, it says, we're to be living in expectation. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. That word, looking, in, in Luke 1 and verse 21. Look there with me, would you? Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, third book of the New Testament. Luke chapter 1. Aren't you glad you have a Bible? We can turn the pages and look it up and see it for ourselves. You know what's happening in Luke 1, right? Zacharias in the temple, uh, taking care of his business in the temple. But it's a different day for Zacharias, isn't it? What's going to happen while he's going about his duties in the temple? An angel appears to him. What's the angel tell him? Yeah, well, he's not going to have a baby, but his wife is. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would really been something there. But uh, he said, yeah, you're, you, uh, Elizabeth's going to have a baby. And Zacharias, didn't, he didn't want to believe it, did he? And, and, and so the angel said, okay, you're not going to be able to speak until he's born. And, and so he, he, he tied him up so he couldn't speak. But wait a minute, the people are all waiting outside expecting him to come out, and he hasn't come out yet. That's a, that's a worrisome thing. Now, I, I've read, I, I don't know if it's true or not, I've read it before, and they, they say that when the high priest would go in, what Zacharias was doing, uh, to make a sacrifice for the people, that uh, he went in to make that sacrifice, that they would always uh, 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 tie something around his ankle, a rope, and he would take that rope in with him, that if, the, if there was some sin or someone that he, in, wrong in him, impurity, that God didn't accept the sacrifice, and he killed the priest, they, they couldn't go in. They weren't allowed. God had killed them. They'd drag him out. with the, they, the priest, member had bells on the bottom of his garment so they could hear him moving around and such. And they, they just made, he hadn't come out yet. They were a little concerned that something might have happened. Now notice, look at verse 21. And the people waited for Zacharias. That word waited there is the same word as looking. Looking. Same word as used looking in Second Peter. So they're, they're looking for Zacharias. They're waiting for Zacharias. They marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. They, they, they were expecting to see him. And they kept waiting for that, that curtain to open for him to walk out. And it, and it wasn't happening. And they were, they were, they were expecting to see him. The word, that, that's the expectation that we're supposed to have waiting for Christ. Looking, do you, ever, do you ever see cloud formations? Do you ever see the sun coming through the clouds or whatever? And you look up and you think, man, maybe Jesus is going to come through there. Do you ever have that thought? Thought that thought before. Maybe that's when Jesus will come. That's the expectation. And then hasting, hasting under the coming of the Lord. Hasting means, means to urge on. It means to await with eager desire. In other words, we're anxiously desiring that Something should happen. In fact, we'd like to uh, accelerate it if we could and make it come quicker, if at all possible. 
And so the true Christian does not dread the coming of Jesus Christ. He looks forward to it and welcomes it, the return of his Lord and Savior. Now I'm willing, while we're willing to wait for it, we ought to be expecting it, and we ought to be desiring for it to come. Look at Titus chapter 2 with me, would you please? Titus chapter 2. If you're in 2 Peter, you go to your left. If, you, if you're over in Luke, you have to come to your right. It's after the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You go through 1 2 Thessalonians, 1 2 Timothy, and then you'll come to Titus. Titus was another preacher boy of the Apostle Paul. And again, he's teaching him something here. And notice what he says in Titus 2 and verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. And listen, hope, you have to understand something again, how, how our language is so deteriorated uh, in the, from what it was in the 1600s. Hope in those days, hope is it used in the Bible. Hope doesn't mean cross your fingers, hope to die, cross my heart, carry a four-leaf clover in my pocket and a horseshoe in my other. That, that's hope and wish. That's not what hope means in the Bible. Hope means an absolute surety. Hope, the Bible talks about it, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Well, you, don't anchor your, you don't anchor something down on a, on a wish. You anchor it on a sure thing. When we talk about the blessed hope, we're not saying, oh, I cross my fingers, I hope he's coming. No, no, no. It's, not a, it's a blessed hope. It's a blessed assurance that Jesus said, I will come again. And we're looking for that blessed hope. We're looking for that blessed surety. The songwriter said, maybe today my Lord will come for me. Maybe today my Savior I shall see. Maybe today from sin I shall be free. Jesus will come and I will go home. It may be today. And that would be a wonderful day. So we, we, we live in expectation. All right? Live in holiness and godliness. We live in expectation. Now go back to, to 2 Peter chapter 3. Notice with me verse number 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you be found of Him in peace, without spot, and blameless. So we're supposed to be, how are we supposed to live? In peace. In peace. What's peace? Peace is to be free from harm in spirit, mind, and body. Free from harm in spirit, mind, and body. And the way you do that is, he mentions it right here, to be without spot and blameless. To be without spot. You remember when we were talking about the false teachers? He called them spots and blemishes. Remember that? Uh, then he says, you're not to be a spot and blemish. Now the only way you're going to have peace with God and, and by the way, is in Jesus Christ. When you're in Christ, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't have peace with God. Pretty simple. All right? And so you have to have peace with Him. Now, don't, when you're saved, God cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Okay? We're clean. And God says, let's keep, Let's keep it unspotted. Let's not let it get stained by sin. Okay? And, and what, what's a spot? Remember, it's a mark that is different than the overall fabric. Okay? Um, got all the way to church tonight. Walking in the door. I've taken my long coat off. And my wife says, uh-oh. Oh, it's never good when your wife looks at you and says, uh-oh. He says, you got something white on the back of your pant leg. And got off us and looked on there, and I, I don't know what it is, paint or something. I haven't been around any paint. But I got on paint. I get water out in the rag, and I'm trying to scrub it off. Nothing's going to work. See? It was obvious because it's white on a beige pair of pants. Okay? And that's a spot. So I had to go back home, get on gray pants. <laughs> and... Bring the gray pants to church, okay? 
And because the spot is there. And you know what? It, it, it's, it's very noticeable. Because it doesn't match the rest of the fabric. It's, it's a spot. And you don't look at yourself and you've got a big spot on your shirt or a spot on your blouse or, or something like that and say, eh, that's all right. No one will notice. No, you don't do that. You notice. And you don't accept that. But it's funny how often we'll, we'll allow spots, blots, stains to be in our Christian life. And we don't do anything about it. And we think nobody notices. But it's pretty noticeable. And, and, it, and, it, and it hurts our testimony. Let me ask you this. Are there any marks in your life that do not match the fabric of Christ in you? The fact that you're, you, you say I'm a Christian, that's the fabric of my life? Are there spots that don't match that? That you need to do something about? So let's be without spot. What about blameless? Blameless means not guilty. It means not able to be blamed. And God said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 23, it's a great verse. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. Let me read it to you. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's asking God here to blame your, your spirit, soul, and body. Be preserved blameless. We are made blameless when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We are not guilty. We are declared not guilty in the sight of God when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. There's nowhere to put a blame. Hey, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody can. Because it's only God that can condemn. Nobody else can. When we've been declared not guilty in His sight, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. If not, you're condemned. Hey, he that believeth not, the Bible says, is condemned already. Because you haven't believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so, you're already in condemnation if you don't believe in Christ. But now, listen, blameless means, listen, when we live... We have the peace when we're blameless, when we're living in harmony with the nature God's given us. God gives us His nature, the new nature, the Bible calls it, the new man when we accept Christ as our Savior. Okay? And we get peace when we live in harmony with that new nature. That's when we have the peace of God that comes to our heart. Listen, um, if you... If you bring a, when you're fishing and you catch a fish and you pull the fish out of the water and you just take them off the hook and throw them in the bottom of the boat, what's he do? Yeah, he's going crazy, isn't he? Does he look peaceful? <laughs> no, rather frantic, doesn't he? He's fighting for his life. You know why? That isn't his nature. That's not what he was created to be in a boat. He was created to be in the water you took him out of that and you trying to make him put him in an, in an in an environment that is a contrary to his nature it doesn't work if a if a bird flew into this room would it be at peace no be flying around smashing into walls and windows trying to find a way out where it belongs where God created it to be well, God created you and God created me. Listen, when you got saved, He gave us the Holy Spirit. He created us to walk in the Spirit. He created us to be filled with the Spirit. And when we do not do that, we're living contrary to our nature, contrary to what God created us for. And you don't have any peace. That's why so many Christians are frustrated. And, and you don't have the peace and you don't have the... The, you're not living in peace. You're living in frustration. Because you're not living in agreement with the nature that God gave you. He, he made us to walk in the Spirit and to live in the Spirit. And when you don't do that, you don't have peace. You know why? You're a fish out of water. Let me ask you a question. Where are you, where are you happiest? Are you happiest around Christian people? Are you happier 
around unsaved people? Where do you feel at home? Okay, Think about that. And then that may just identify your nature. You've heard me say it before. You can, you can take a sheep and you can drop them in the mud hole and the first thought of that sheep is to do what? Get out of the mud. And you clean that sheep up and it's not going back to the mud hole. But I can take the pig and take him out of the mud hole and wash him up and clean him up and put perfume on him and put a bow around his neck. But the first chance the pig gets, where's he going? Go in the middle. Why? That's his nature. It's not the nature of the lamb. It's not the nature of the sheep. Where does your nature take you? Where does your nature take you? And when it, listen, you, you, you just, you ever, you ever been in a place? And, 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 and you, right away, as soon as you walked into the place, they're just, it just came overwhelming to you. I don't belong here. I need to get out of here. This isn't where I belong. That's, that's the Spirit of God letting you know this is not compatible with the nature I've given you. Get out of here. When we get in trouble is when we ignore that and we just blow through it anyway. We ignore the stop signs. But that's the, listen, that's where you get peace. You say, boy, I just don't have any peace in my heart. Uh, check, check how you're living. Check the environment you've created. See if that's in agreement with your nature that God's given you. You're not going to be peace when you're not living in the environment God created you to be in. You're like a fish out of water. Maybe that's why some are uncomfortable in church. Because that's not the environment. Because they don't have the new nature yet. Oh, but once you get saved and once you get born again, guess what? That changes. Then you look forward to being in church. You look forward to being with God's people. You look forward to the things of God. Where before, that was like, oh, man, I don't want to do with those weirdos. See? But what, what happens is you have to be born again. You have to get a new nature. And God gives you that when you get saved. So we live in holiness and godliness and expectation and we live in peace. And then, fourthly, we live in spiritual growth. Back to 2 Peter chapter 3. We live in spiritual growth. He says in verse 18, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Spiritual growth. Grace opened the epistle and now grace closes the epistle. Thank God for grace. The grace of God. The sufficiency of God. Now it says we're to be growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Over in 1 Peter it says that we're to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. As newborn babes you desire the milk of the word so you can grow. And, and it's normal for a baby to grow. As I grow in grace and I grow and I increase in my knowledge of Christ I increase in being like Christ. I desire to be like Him and to live as He lived. The, remember, we talked about the greatest safeguard to being a led, led away by error, to falling from steadfastness, is to increase in holiness, increase in the knowledge of Christ, to continue to grow up in your Christian faith, and getting to know Christ, by the way, knowing personally by the Holy Spirit of God and by you reading and studying the Bible. God wants to, God wants to have that great... He doesn't just want you to know about Him because what everybody else tells you. He wants you to know Him. He wants to have a relationship with you. So take time to get to know Him and talk to Him personally and let the Spirit of God help you. And when you do that, notice what happens. To Him be glory both now and forever. That, that glorifies God. That brings glory to Him. The life of a Christian is spiritual growth. You can't get away from it. You're born as a babe in Christ. I, I met a lady today at a shoe store. And she uh, told her I was a pastor. And we're a pastor at church. She goes, oh, I go to the West, West, 
West something, Free Will Baptist, uh, West Side, maybe, I don't know. And um, Free Will Baptist, she didn't, and she began to tell me that she just got saved in 2008. She said, I, I'm in May 14, 2008. I said, man, that's great. I said, boy, you're, you're just going to about come up on your eighth spiritual birthday. And she goes, yeah, I'm still a babe. Still a babe in Christ. And you are, you're eight years old. I mean, that's not a baby baby, but it's still a, a young, young Christian. And, and we, we had a good time of fellowship there talking. And, and you know, you, you're start, that's Christian life. You start as a babe and then you begin to grow. You're, you, you begin to desire the sincere milk of the word that you can grow thereby. And, and you grow and you become eventually a, a, a child. And then eventually, if you're a man, a young man. And then eventually a man and then a father. And every, every father was once an infant. Had, he not, had, had you not grown, you'd never become an adult. You'd never have been a mother or a father. And when you content yourself with the grace you had when you got saved, and you're content to stay there, then you're in a continual state of infancy. You're, you're content with staying a baby. You're content with being a child. You know, when you don't grow, what happens when you have a baby that isn't growing? You have an infant, you've been born at 7 pounds, 8 ounces, and a month you weigh them and they're 7 pounds, 8 ounces, or 7 pounds, 5 ounces, and you let another week or two go by and they're still at 7 pounds. What are you going to do? You're going to take that doctor and say, what's wrong? My baby isn't growing. You know something's wrong when they're not growing. Why don't we look at our own Christian life and say, hey, I'm not growing, what's wrong? Something wrong. I need to be growing. And if they're not growing, we know we have to get some help or we have to get something examined because something's wrong and if we don't do something, they are going to die. They're going to get sickly and they're going to die. And listen, if you don't grow as a believer, you are going to get sick as a, as a believer and you're going to be sickly as a believer and you are going to die. Now, you may die physically, but I know this, you'll die to the things of God. You'll die to valuing anything that God values. It won't interest you at all. The only interest, and that's why, that's why you get led away with false doctrine. Like a child, you follow the next shiny object that comes along. The next pretty thing that you see. And you go chasing after it. And you don't grow up into Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Would you go over there please? Go back to your left again. Uh, to Galatians and Ephesians. If you hit Philippians, Colossians, it's before those. Ephesians chapter 4. He talks here in verse 11 about how he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And by the way, he's given those to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Notice, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more what? Be no more what? Children. Children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. How easy is it to deceive a child? You can deceive a child. You can say, which hand is it in? And you can just switch it quick and they don't catch it. They'll say, oh, wow. Slight of hand. Deception. It's amazing what you can do with, with children. And he's talking here spiritually. You're not, don't be a spiritual child. But speaking the truth in love, verse 15, may, what's the next two words, church? Grow up, and the next two? Into Him. Into him. In all things, which is the head, even Christ. Grow up into Him in all things. There's your Christian life. We're always growing up. 
And you know why? Because we're not going to get there until we get to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know what that means? You're never going to arrive. And I'm not going to arrive. Nobody ever can say, I've, I've made it. I'm at the pinnacle of spiritual maturity. You know, nobody will say that. Because we're not going to measure up to the fullness of the stature of Christ till we see Him, and then we shall be like Him because we'll see Him as He is. 1 John 3, 3. Okay? So we're continuing. We're always growing. Don't stop growing. Grow in the grace and knowledge and grow up. And when you grow up, that brings glory to God. Don't be satisfied being a child. Don't be satisfied where, where you're the one. Listen, children need attention. Children need to be have people take care of them. They would always be watching them, being taken care of. You know what? That's, that's, and by the way, you're describing most average church members. That's sad, isn't it? You know what the word, you know what we need in our churches? People to grow up. Be a spiritual Christian. Be an adult Christian. What do adults do? Adults do what they're supposed to do. You remember when we started, by the way, remember, this brings glory to God and that's what we're supposed to do. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. When we started the study in 2 Peter, the first Wednesday of January, eight weeks ago or so, we said the theme of 2 Peter was knowing the Lord Jesus and doing what you know is right to do. Knowing the Lord Jesus and doing what you know is right to do. Because apostasy, false teaching, is best defended or best withstood by knowing the truth and living the truth. When you know the truth and you live the truth, you're not going to be led away by error. won't happen. And that brings glory to God. And when you live to bring glory to God, that's higher ground. Amen. That's higher ground. That's where we want to be. So the admonition to close the epistle, and our admonition to close tonight is to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Let's stand together, shall we? Heavenly Father, take the truth here this evening. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for giving these words to the Apostle Peter to pen. And Lord, my prayer tonight is that each person here would know Christ as their personal Savior. And then I would pray, Lord, that those who know Him as their Savior, that we would be living as we know we ought to live. But Father, that we would not have and not settle for spots and blemishes. We would live up to our calling. Live up to the righteousness that's been given to us in Christ Jesus. And that we would be growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That we would be desiring to be like Him. And as we grow and we mature, that we would measure only, we would only measure ourselves by Christ. We would say with the songwriter, oh, to be like Him. Oh, to be like Him. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Pastor, I, I know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. There's a time in my life when I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Pastor, I, I'm absolutely certain of that. I know that I'm saved. Would you slip your hand up for a moment that I may see it? All right, you may put it down. You're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have, I have no idea if I died whether I go to heaven or go to hell. My friend, I tell you what, you, 
you'd like to go to heaven. If there's a choice, and you have a choice, I'll guarantee you you want to go to heaven. You don't want to go to hell. And I'll not embarrass anybody. I'll not call you out. But if you would just say, Pastor, pray for me tonight. I'm not certain that I'd go to heaven. In fact, I think I'd probably go to hell. But I sure would appreciate you praying for me. Would you just slip your hand up and put it back down and say, pray for me? God bless you. Thank you. Are there others tonight? Appreciate your honesty. No wonder how many believers here tonight would say, Preacher. I'm not, I'm not living in agreement with my nature. I don't have a lot of peace in my heart as a Christian because I'm not living in agreement with the new nature God put in me. In fact, maybe you're not sure because maybe you're more around, you're more comfortable around the wrong. You're more comfortable in the mud hole than you are in the sheepfold. And that's something very seriously to consider. Or maybe you're here tonight and would say, Pastor, in light of the coming of Christ, in light that everything's going to burn up, I do want to live in godliness and holiness. I do want to live in peace. I do want to, I, I do want to live in expectation of the Lord's return. I do want to live growing in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. How many of you would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart tonight. Please remember me in prayer when you close. Will you slip your hand up tonight, Christian? Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. All right, you may put them down. Don't always give the invitation on Wednesday night, but we're going to have, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to have Lisa just play a verse or two of a song. If you want to use the altar tonight, I think I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. If you don't know for sure that if you died, you go to heaven and you'd like someone to take a Bible and show you how, as soon as I'm done praying and the piano begins to play, just meet me right down here at the front. We'll have someone take you aside and take a Bible and just show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Lord, I, I just feel impressed that we ought to have this invitation. And I, Lord, I pray that you get up each individual to do what you're telling them to do in their heart. May you hear our prayer that we make on bended knee this evening. Lord, help each one to respond to what you've already spoken to their heart to do. Help no one to hold back and resist you. And I'll thank you for it. Now with your heads bowed as you continue to pray, Lisa's going to play and as she plays, God has spoken to your heart, respond to him. That's right. Make sure... Make sure you're saved. If you want someone to show you, I'll, I'll just come. We'll meet you. Will you do it? Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now this evening. We thank you, Lord, for 
speaking to hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for decisions that have been made for thee. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to leave this place now mindful of what you've done in each one of our lives. Help us to live the Bible we've learned and been reminded of this evening. Lord, help us to live in expectation that each day, maybe today, my Lord would come for me. And Lord, help us to be found in you without spot and blameless. Lord, living godly and living holy, growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, help us to be like thee. Lord, dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. And may others see Christ in us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Higher ground, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground, let's sing it together. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher. Sing it. And let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir members, come right.